Mole rats. There are so many different kinds of mole rats. We need a musical theater full of rodents who <laughs> dig in the ground and have big front teeth. Mole it's like rats. it's like cats, but <laughs> instead of rumbly tumbly, it's like bitey scratchy immune to cancer. It's our body and scratchy immune to cancer. Mole have no rats. pain in dots. <laughs> <laughs> all right oh we are live we are live hello everybody we are just you know moving on down the road uh hey co-hosts are you ready to start this show born ready well actually i was ready about 20 minutes ago but <laughs> let's yeah. do it you had to learn to read and write and type and all that stuff before and i finished. only finished ready. that 20 minutes ago so let's do it <laughs> okay starting the show in three two this is twist this Week in Science, episode number 656, recorded on Wednesday, January 31st, 2018, under the super blue blood moon. Hey everyone, I am Dr. Kiki, and tonight we are going to fill your heads with genetic jitters, gold microbes, and rooster roadies. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. What you put in determines what you can get out. And it doesn't really matter what stuff you are putting in or what you are putting that stuff into. Putting in a decent effort will get a result different than putting in no effort at all. Inputting reliable data will result in more reliable data out. Placing potatoes in a pot of boiling water is much more likely to get you a pot of boiled potatoes than if you had filled your pot with onions. And while this may seem obvious to all, it's not what we often practice. For all around us, all the time, people are placing onions into pots of boiling water and expecting boiled potatoes as a result. Like relaxing your way to getting fit, or eating junk food and still wishing to lose weight, or staying up too late and still hoping to be well-rested, or tuning into nonsense shows yet still wanting to become more intelligent but they all end up with boiled onions, which if covered in melted cheese with a dollop of sour cream is still a great snack to relax to with a late night Netflix binge on your couch. And yet you have found your way here to the place that will put potatoes into your pot, or in this case, science into your brain so that you can achieve the result you actually desire to know what is happening this week in science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. What's happening? What's happening this week in science? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening this week in science? Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And the good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again on the day of the super blue blood moon and International Zebra Day. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. Blair. <laughs> Blair probably. Well, knew. everyone with a twist calendar knew, right? <laughs> That's right. So super blue blood moon, it doesn't really roll off the tongue as nicely as you'd like, but did anyone wake up at five-ish? Well, I mean, if you're on the West Coast at five-ish this morning, 5.30 this morning, to nope. see the, nope. the super moon, meaning that it's actually slightly gravitationally closer to the Earth than usual uh a blue moon meaning that it was a second full moon in the month of january or you know in any month but this is january and a blood moon which means it was an eclipse a lunar eclipse wherein the moon passes passes through the shadow of the earth mm -hmm. right i yeah. wish i had seen it 
and the light from the sun as it passes through the atmosphere of the earth imparts the light with a red shifted hue. Mm. So then we see a ready bloody moon. And it signifies a month of pain and suffering. Well, <laughs> just, well yeah, February. I mean, it is <laughs> like... <laughs> I think, goodness, it's the shortest month of the year. That's all I can <laughs> say. It was wed for Valentine's Day. Oh, Getting ready. Oh, no, no. <laughs> that moon, it's just bloody with love. Yeah. That's yeah, right. that's what's full of your heart. It's all up in your heart is blood. Yeah. Well, I tried to get up this morning, but you know what? I live in Portland, Oregon, <laughs> and clouds, mm. rain. Oh. That'll no, happen. Like the, no view of the moon whatsoever. But NASA was nice enough to put a feed Ooh. up. So, you know, it's probably out there still. Lots of images people took of the beautiful moon and all its big blue and red glory. Yeah, it was there. But we have other awesome things going on this week. Science news, you know. I got it. Mm -hmm. I have new stories about jittery genes, muscle memories, and long-lived rats. Hmm. Justin, what you got? I've got a vaccine for cancer. Why Lady Luck is no lady. And there's gold in them bar microbes. <laughs> I want to know more about that. Is this a new gold rush? Yeah. Yeah. Blair, what mm. is in the animal corner? I have some cockadoodle rooster roadies, and I have some uh, zebra toes, actually. In honor zebra, of zebra, zebra toes, really? This zebra is, tootsies. This is maybe something you should keep to yourself. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I was telling you before the show, toes. you know, zebra toes with just a little bit of barbecue sauce on them. They're just oh no, nope. oh dear. <laughs> oh, dear. All right, everyone. These are the stories and more that are yet to come in the show. As we jump on in, I want to remind you that you can subscribe to This Week in Science, the podcast on iTunes, in the Google Play podcast portal, Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn, all of those wonderful places where podcasts are found. And you can also find us on YouTube and Facebook. Look for This Week in Science. You can also look for us at twist.org. Org, T W I S dot O R G. But now it is time for the science. Da, 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 da. So let's jump into the show with some naked mole rats. Hmm. Yes. Well, naked mole rats. We know them as the, well, I think they're cute, but maybe some people don't. They're. Mm -hmm. They're hairless for the most part. They have like little hair spines that help them find their way around in the tunnels under the ground that they dig. Um, and these naked mole rats have big old teeth. They're blind. And they're, I, I think they're pretty cute in a strange kind of way. But the thing that we like about them scientifically is that they are fascinating for their health. Turns out they don't get cancer. Their uh, immune systems are amazing. And um, they don't seem to get those diseases of aging that a lot of other species mm -hmm. get. And that is what this study that I am going to talk about right now pretty much uh, is all about. Um, on elifesciences.org. So elife is an online open source uh, uh, publication journal so that everyone, uh, this link will be on our show notes, everyone can read this article if they're interested. Researchers published a paper called Naked Mole Rat Mortality Rates Defy Gumpertsian Laws by Not Increasing with Age. So Gumpertsian, Gumperts, Gumperts, uh, came up with uh, a rule for mammalian aging. And basically that rule is that as you age past, especially humans, as, past the age of 30 years old, for every eight years later that you live, your mortality or the probability of you dying um, increases by like, like double, it doubles. And the so real downer. <laughs> yeah, so 
So pretty much uh, the it, it becomes an exponential curve upward where you start out young, you know, fairly healthy, low mortality from most causes. And then as you age, the chance of death is greater and greater and greater from all causes. And um, and and this happens in a cross species. And we know that for rats and mice, but rats, which are related to the naked mole rat, the naked mole rat, as Blair has told me, is a kind of rat, even though it doesn't really look like a rat, it is a kind of rat. And most rats will live only a few years, maybe four or five, six years tops for a good healthy rat. Naked mole rats will live upwards of 30 years. And so the researchers have been studying this longest lived rodent uh, for in, in the laboratory in captive care for uh, over 30 years. The researchers have been doing their work and taking notes and numbers on these animals the entire time and have come at this point to be able to actually say some interesting things about them. So the maximum lifespan is fivefold greater than pre predicted by this Gumpertsian law for a similar sized rodent. And uh, these, even in the wild, naked mole rats are considered to be long lived and breeding females last up until about 17 years. So very long into the, late into their life, the females are able to breed. And uh, other rodents only usually last about a season. So the, um, these analyses that they did in mole rat lifespans of over 3,000 individuals found that a substantial portion of the population survived to at least 8, 30 years of age. And this is regardless of whether they're male or female, whether they're breeding or non-breeding, and there's something that's going on that allows them to continue aging without aging. They get older without aging. So what usually happens in the study of gerontology or the study of aging is that uh, individuals come to a point where senescence starts to begin. And that uh, that probability increases as you get older. And once you hit senes senescence or somewhere around there, things just start to go wrong. Your body starts to fall apart and it just doesn't keep itself up anymore. And these mole rats keep themselves up for a very long time. And the question now really is how? It's got to have to do with their telomeres, right? I mean, that's ultimately what what we usually credit with old age and dying of old age is DNA replication malfunction because your little shoelace tips have come off <laughs> on your DNA strand. So I think we've got to look at their DNA. So the DNA and people have looked at, uh, uh, are looking at their telomeres and are looking at their D DNA. Um, and so they, they say in the discussion of their paper that, um, that what they think might be going going on is that there are negl negligible, there's been not much literature documenting it, systems-based senescence in these mole rats. And the and they think that maybe there's delayed Gumpertsian aging, but not non-existent. So that instead of this aging curve starting early in life, that it just happens a lot later in life. And if that's the way that it works, that's kind of cool. And we want to learn how to do that too, so that we can live longer, healthier, just like them. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know though. Our, where are humans along that curve? Like, I feel like we live a pretty long time. Like we're not a tortoise. Mm, we're well, just about other, other apes have a fairly similar aging process as we do. They definitely chimpanzees and gorillas often live into their late 50s, which is probably pretty standard for us before a lot of our major medicine breakthroughs. Mm. Yeah. So I don't think we're that. But with, with all the medicine that we can throw at, say, an ape in the zoo, they're not yeah, but, 90. Well, but the difference is that an ape can't say, my foot feels funny. Will you look at that? 
Yeah, but oh, they're, also not, my they're also not smoking and drinking and driving cars. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like we've been, I think we're- But if you, we're, but if, but if you start thinking about the, the diseases of aging and when they start uh, hitting people, usually it's within the 30s to 40s is really? when diseases of aging, cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, um, muscle problem, you know, it, these things start to start to kick in, you know, um, start to, but reproduction, reproduction in females uh, declines in the thirties to forties. You have, I mean, even though we are long lived mammals, the body yeah. begins this aging process at an early, early stage at an early right. point. And, and, and so, so what, what I'm, what I, my, delay that. My, my question was more about where do we draw our baseline of where we should fit if we're already double what <laughs> the, uh, you know, what the lifespan should be for an ape of our size. That's fine. What we learned, we might not get fivefold, which, by the way, I hate folds. Nobody should ever talk folds. <laughs> the folds makes no sense to me to this day. Nobody can ever explain folds to the me. The multiplication factor. It's not, though. It's not. <laughs> Uh, and a two-fold increase is the same as tripling something, timesing it by three. That's that's just not, you can't, folds and it's different. Anyway. <laughs> Tangent <laughs> station boarding. <laughs> five-fold increase six times. That's what I'm saying. Anyway. Um, it, I, I think I think if, if we could unlock these mysteries and apply them to humans, it would do really wonderful things for some of us, but then there'd be so many of us for so long, like our reproduction rates, our everything else rates, our consumption rates are, are yes. already ahead I, of our curve. Well, and our, that's, that's, sure the, that's the question we keep talking about with, you know, I, later we're going to be hearing about a potential solution for cancer. So every time we talk about that, we all know people, pretty much everybody knows somebody who has had some kind of cancer at some point. And it would be great to be able to take care of that and to reduce the amount of loved ones lost from cancer. But every time you cross a disease off the list, even way back when they crossed off polio as a problem, that changes the population that we are likely to have on our planet and it changes the way that we stress our planet. So of course, there's a lot of things to be considered with that. Right. But of and course, as you would usually say, foremost, Justin, you would just send those people to Mars. Right? No, so. no, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> what I would suggest is actually far more logical. I think everybody should be here on the planet and we should be um, more, more, uh, more respectful of the, the limited resources we can pull from the planet. I think we need to get to the point where genetic modification allows people to be no more than three feet tall. And once right. we get there, so that we don't need as many, yeah, we could have twice <laughs> as many people on the resources we already yeah, are using just, now. Turn and every just floor into two floors of them because yeah, we'd yeah. be smaller. Yeah, just, I mean, think of the real like, estate like, boom. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put a second, <laughs> a second floor in my one story house now because I'm only three feet tall and it will work. Yep, yep. <laughs> so, um. These, the, the study <laughs> does raise interesting points. What is going on in the DNA of the yeah. and the, the metabolism and the mechan cellular machinery that keep these naked mole rats alive and not just alive on, on life support, but very healthy and able to survive in extreme conditions at that. And then based on kind of jumping off from here, uh, I found another study that is ta talking about um, the chemistry of DNA, and it's published in Nature this week. Researchers have been, since about 2000, well, before 2015, but in 2015, they reported that they had discovered this shape-shifting, or that DNA vibrates, things vibrate and move around a little bit. And when that happens, sometimes it, there are these jitters, these quantum jitters that allow the bases, you know, the, the G, the T, the C, the A, all these, the numbers that we use to make up our, or the letters that we use that are actually little molecules that we use to make up our DNA, that they can shape shift. And so whereas a, a, a G normally likes to line up next to a C, sometimes it 
there's a mutation that's wrong and something gets, gets added in incorrectly and you have a G next to a T, an accident, you know? And how do these accidents happen? Why, if we have this wonderful cellular replication machinery that fixes its errors, why do we have mutations? Why does this even happen? And so when actually Francis and Crick came up with the concept of DNA and this, the, the DNA helix, the alpha helix structure, the helical structure and how it all zippered together and worked together, they postulated that there was some kind of shape-shifting that takes place and that molecules for split seconds might change their structure or vibrate into a different form so that they can line up and then get overlooked as a mutation. And in 2015, some researchers from Duke University came up with some evidence that this seemed to be right. And just this week, they have published again in Nature saying they have been able to replicate the one in 10,000 timing, the clock of mutations that occurs in DNA. They've been able to replicate that in the lab. And it indeed, when they, when they um, use this, their process, they are able to uh, make these molecules, these DNA bases line up incorrectly so that a G lines up with a T and creates these incorrect mutations. Now, one of the interesting aspects of this is, so the question this researcher, the senior author on the paper, Hashim L. Ash, M. L. Hashimi, he said, increasing or decreasing the rates of spontaneous mutations could significantly alter the ability of an organism to evolve or, like we were talking about cancer, alter its susceptibility to disease. An interesting question is, what determines the mutation rate in a living organism? From there, we can begin to understand the specific conditions or environmental stressors that can elevate these, these errors. And so in their laboratory conditions, what they found is that when these quantum jitters occur and the shape shifting happens for a split second, this one out of 10,000 times that leads to a mutation, they found that the rearrangements have different varieties. Sometimes they form anions, which are negative in charge, and other times they're more positive and they have these different isomers. They're called tautomeric. And they found that when these, uh, these conditions take place, they, the different alternative states contribute to these errors. So in normal conditions, when there weren't any environmental stressors, the tautomeric forms dominated. But when the conditions changed in the presence of cancer-causing mutagens and environmental stresses, the mutations took the anionic form. And so now, not only have they supported the timing clock for mutations taking place in DNA and the uh, mechanism by which mutations form, they also can show a direction for us to start looking for disease-causing mutations with these anionic structures. And so this might lead to a much better way of looking for mutations within our DNA with a very specific form and also potentially to treating because it's a very specific molecular structure for a specific DNA target that we could use, you know, something like, uh, you know, CRISPR, other things that we're looking at these days. Yeah. But it's a very interesting line of study that this re these researchers are working on. Wow. That's, yeah. yep. Lab-based proof of mutation is pretty cool. Yeah. And, and... 65 years after Watson and Crick suggested this idea, yeah. it's supporting it. It's proving it, which is... That's, gosh, that's just so... This is exactly why this kind of research is so important. This is why revisiting old studies is so important. This is why continuing on these lines, you know, the, the whole idea of replicating the primordial soup, right? That was something that was just something that someone theorized you could potentially do in a lab when I was learning about it. And now people have actually done it. This is exactly those things that 
that that are what young minds need to hear about to really be able to understand the mechanism of our world. Yeah. And so So amazing. And even this question of, well, how can mutations arise on their own in the DNA? This answers that question. It is a mechanism. The quantum vibrations in our proteins, in the molecules that make us up, these quantum vibrations, jitters, yeah, it's not a mistake. It's, it's not, not a freak freak accident. Yeah. It's it's part it's part of the superstructure of life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's these reverberations and vibrations that lead to slight structural changes that then because they happened at just the right moment get locked into place because the zipper got zipped. That is the coolest. This is this is the coolest. This we might have to hear about this again at our end of 2018 show, honestly. Mm-hmm. This is great. Right? So fascinating. I was like reading through it. I'm like, wait, what is this? Wait, wait, this is kind of exciting and interesting. This is the chemistry of life, yo. <laughs> <laughs> kinetics. That's right. The kinetics of chemistry. This is to life. Life and the variety of life mm-hmm. and our universe is amazing. Mm-hmm. without having to make anything extra up. Right? <laughs> this is what science is about. Yeah, we didn't make it up. This is just... Just oh, looking at what's actually happening is is awesome. In the true meaning of the world word. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and if you experience that thing firsthand, you might even say, Eureka! Mm, time for Justin's story. What you got there? Which is uh, the phrase exclaimed by Archimedes as he unlocked the laws of displacement while stepping into a bath. In fact, he even said it twice. Eureka! Eureka! Though it is possible that the bath was also too hot. And this is always what he said on some occasions. <laughs> but uh, never had previous cause to then run about telling everyone about something other than boiled toes. Eureka is also the motto of the state of California. It was exclaimed. uh, The exclamation Eureka was made at a mill, uh, Sutter's Mill, by operator Jim uh, James Marshall in Colma, California, 170 years ago, upon discovering a nugget of gold in the American River. Mm. While the world of science is filled with Eureka moments like these, the next story seems to fit that mold a little too perfectly. For Eureka, there's gold in them. There are microbes. What? Huh? Bacterium, cupria, vetus, metalli durans, to be exact. High concentrations of heavy metals are usually toxic to living things, but not cupria, v- <laughs> cupria vetus, metalli durans, which is adapted to survive in heavy metal environments. One interesting side effect of this rod-shaped headbanger of a bacterium, the formation of tiny gold nuggets within it. A team of researchers at Martin Luther University, Hal Wittenberg, uh, the Technical University of Munich, and the University of Adelaide, Australia, have discovered the molecular process that take place inside this bacteria. And this is going to be, if you're looking for it, it's in the journal Metallomics by the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, Metallodrons primarily lives in soils that are enriched with heavy metals. Over time, these minerals break down in the soil and they release toxic heavy metals and hydrogen into their environment. Copper is one of these metals and it's a vital trace element that metallodrons needs, but too much of it and it becomes toxic. So it needs just the right amount. When copper and gold particles come into contact with the bacteria, There's a range of chemical processes that take place. Copper is usually too difficult to actually be taken up. The form that's in the soil is too difficult to be taken up. So it's then converted into a form that is easier for the bacteria to import and reach the interior of the cell where the the cell wants it to be, bacteria wants it to be. And uh, it happens that same process also brings in a little bit of gold. When too much copper is accumulated, it normally gets pumped out. But when there's gold in there as well, it sticks around. And this is according to Professor Dietrich Nyes, microbiologist at MLU, 
When gold compounds are also present, the enzyme, uh, which is cup A, is suppressed and the toxic copper and gold compounds remain, remain inside the cell. Copper and gold combined are actually more toxic than when they appear there on their own. So to solve this problem, the bacteria activate another enzyme, cop A, before it was cup A, this is cop A. This enzyme transforms the copper and gold compounds to their or back into their organically difficult to absorb forms, ensuring that fewer copper and gold compounds enter the cellular interior. Bacteria is then less poisoned and the enzyme that pumps out the copper can dispose of the excess copper unimpeded. And the gold eh, just sort of sticks around in the difficult to absorb form in the outer area of the cell and becomes a gold nugget, which is not like a really big nuggets, nanometers, it's really tiny, mm -hmm. but you get enough of them. And it turns out this is what's called a secondary gold formation. So we have the, whatever, the supernova that took place and these things are flying around and they become part of the planet and then they melt with the lava and they get moved around, things happen. Uh, this is another way where these teeny tiny little bits can collect and be transformed into, into gold ore, essentially, uh, by the bacteria. So, yeah, maybe a little too soon to start the uh, bacteria gold farm uh, just yet, but <laughs> they are looking at this as a way to remove gold from, from ore. So this bacteria is already used sort of like super fun sites or in industrial sites where they're trying to sort of clean up the heavy metals in the soil. But uh, if this can be used as a, is a way of removing gold from from soil or ore formations as a replacement for for mercury, which is definitely toxic. Super toxic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as as we had used previously up and down the state of California, and which is still highly in use across Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So bacteria gold miners. Uh. I love that idea of using using nature to do to do the job that it does usually, but maybe we can superpower it, soup it up a little bit, <laughs> yeah. make it be a little bit more efficient for our needs. Yeah, I, th I love stuff like this. There's a, I mean, isn't isn't bacterial activity where um, iron bog iron original originates from as well? You know, the Vikings got all of their iron from bogs and. Mm -hmm. All of that iron is due to bacterial activity in the bogs themselves. So, bacteria. You just like saying the word bog. I like it. <laughs> Don't get bogged down on the details. Bog, 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 boggity, bog, bog, bog. Yeah. yeah, this is this is cool. I, yeah, let's keep using the bacteria. And I mean, this just it sits. I mean, we can use the bacteria as they stand, but understanding how the enzymes in the bacterial systems work and how how they get put together to become the machines that they are, um, we can maybe figure out how to use them also and incorporate them into synthetic bacteria. Mm -hmm. Making more. Making more bacteria. Oh, does that bring us to um, a certain time in our show? What time would that be? I think it's time for Blair's Animal Corner. She loves our creature, cried at all. Buy a pet, build a pet, no pet at all. Want to hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels and a bullfrog. Cat Blair. I have some zebras and some horses and some other animals that are on hooves. Now, oh. the conventional wisdom. It behooves you to talk about them now. It does indeed. Uh, so, the conventional wisdom about hooved animals, such as horses, is that they. They started out in jungles and places that were kind of soft on the ground. So they had their five digit foot that was kind of more similar to how a rhino foot or a taper foot looks where they have individual little toesies coming off kind of a big flat foot. And then 
these animals moved onto plains like lands where the soil was very heavily packed, it was very hard ground, and they had to make ground quickly because there wasn't a lot of cover. And in that process, evolutionary pressure led them to the hoof. And the understanding is that that hoof is actually their middle toe and they have a singular toe and that's all that's left. They lost the other four. Well, all equestrians and equestrian related enthusiasts, hold on to your saddles because a new study uh, published this week in the Royal Society Open Science from the New York Institute of Technology says those quote unquote missing digits, all four of them are in fact still there. <gasps> they didn't go away. No. Yes. And I hope that's not a mocking, shocking gasp, Justin, because this is huge. Do I have another kind. <laughs> Modern horses don't just have one toe. No, they're saying they have all five. So really what's going on is their four feet are just big middle fingers. <laughs> so that's a that's what the original expectation was. Right. But now they think that all five fingers have fused into a kind of mitten hand. <sighs> so they actually think all five digits have merged to form a compact forelimb with hooves. So they looked at bones, fossils, arteries, they looked in embryos, they looked in every stage of development, and they really found what they thought were traces of toes. And they found that there are actually splints on the outer edges of the metacarpal, which is the, the main, the toe, right? Um, in modern horses, those splints are remnants of second and fourth digits developmentally. So that seems now for sure. They also argue that the equivalent of the toe and, 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 or sorry, the little toe, the little finger, the pinky kind of, and the thumb, digits number one and number five, they have not entirely disappeared. This is really the new information. They look and they see ridges on the back of those two kind of lessened number two and number four digits that look like these other the pinky and the and the thumb that have fused with those so what they see actually they think is a fusing of like the equivalent of i'm just going to talk in terms of hands because it's easier the thumb and the first finger those fused and then the ring finger and the pinky those fused and then the the fused clumps then fused into and reduced so that the middle finger was still the main one poking out of the bottom of the foot. But they're looking and they see evidence for all five toes. They also traced the gradual metamorphosis over 55 million years of evolution. They went into the fossil record and they found a developmental process that would actually show this line of thinking in terms of the, the different kind of morphs of feet over the years. And they also looked at, they did dissections of fetal and adult horses and looked at neurovascular networks. And those neurovascular networks are consistent with animals with five digits. They, sh they said they should be able to find 10 primary nerves and 10 arteries, and that's exactly what they found. Wow. So this is... So all of the nerves and blood vessels for five digits is are still there and have not gone away. Yeah. The, there is evidence within the bone structure itself, and additionally, there is developmental evidence. Yeah, so... It's pretty pretty solid. Horse has got five digits. Yeah. So this is something that, once again, we're looking at, people have been studying animals for so long, before we knew about genetics, before we knew to look at fetal stages of animals, and that a lot of the time, a fetal stage of an animal will give evolutionary clues, before we knew how to trace things properly in the fossil record. People have been just looking at the, the shape of animals More and problem. drawing conclusions from that, right? Mm -hmm. And And now over the 
thousands and thousands of years of, of this animal observation and categorization, we have to now go back and kind of parse out, wait, what is evidence-based and what is completely observation-based? And what can we add to this and how can we find out more? I mean, the the whole dinosaur categorization mess is a perfect example of that. That's something that they just looked at morphology. They said, well, they look like reptiles. They're reptiles. They're like lizards. They're like giant lizards. It's fine. They're lizards. And then over time, we find out more and more and more. So as we go on our human quest to categorize things, which I won't go off on now, listeners to the show know what I'm alluding to, but <laughs> As we try to categorize and therefore understand and care for wild things, we're, we have we get new pieces of evidence and we have to adjust our expectations. And this is something that has been conventional knowledge for a very, very long time. Think about horses. Think about how deeply involved they are with our history. Yeah. And, and, and now completely changes a lot of things. I mean, of course, this does have a lot of impact on how we care for horses too, especially if you think about um, if you think about injuries to the feet or the legs, you think about vasculature, you think about nerves, all these things. Our care might change as a result of this, which seems crazy. So yeah, well, very, very often, I think that is true that um, we have certain levels of care because of our observations and our observations lead to our understanding, which then informs our actions. And as our observations improve and our understanding changes, so too will our actions. Absolutely. Yeah. And an animal that is responsible for a lot of our successes as a species, we now know more about pretty exciting. And maybe understanding this, I mean, it, especially with the nerve and blood vessel information, I mean, maybe this is the kind of stuff that's kind of research that's going to lead us on a path to being able to help more horses who break legs. Yeah, absolutely. Because that is a big problem is, uh, is, is healing broken legs in horses. Yeah, maybe the reason a broken leg is so devastating on a horse is that there's broken bones or or injured nerves that we didn't know were even there. Yeah. That's, that we hadn't yeah. paid attention to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's pretty, it's pretty exciting and it's pretty interesting. And I, I can't wait to see how it changes, <laughs> changes so much of a uh, of mammal classification. Pretty interesting. Yeah. It's uh, also weird. I've anyway, got 10 right here. Five, five, on, five on five. Five, five on five. I think, I think I'm right when I'm, and I assert that uh, bats are more, closely related to horses than they are to rats or foxes mm -hmm. it's uh yeah. you know there's a lot of and if we all came from little furry shrews at some point shouldn't those yep. digits be everywhere like like what like and the reason i honestly wasn't super surprised that they made this discovery really like they found toes on whales i mean these right. elements that are going to be preserved the way they found it, it's pretty amazing though i, I hadn't uh yeah. i hadn't uh, about the tracking backwards and just seeing the existing nerves that would have been assigned. Yes. Uh, these, these. That's that's pretty a pretty awesome way of doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's definitely something your body would trash if they didn't need it. That's mm -hmm. it's a lot of extra energy you want to get rid of if you don't have those toesies. <sighs> Anywho, uh, moving on to another fascinating discovery in the animal world. What is a, you know, the age-old question, would a rooster make a good roadie? And the answer is yes. And let me tell you why. <laughs> I didn't even know that was a question. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I, gotta, I gotta admit, Blair, I was surprised by that one. Yeah. The age old question. Well, you might run into some problems with him if he starts cock a doodle doing during your set. But usually they do that in the morning, right? And you need some help getting up anyway from those late nights on the road. So when they do that, you would expect a rooster with their extremely loud crowing. And I think both of you having lived in Davis are very aware of how loud roosters can get. I, I love am... the assumption. That yeah, David, even Davis. Just because it's up... far enough from San Francisco, it must just be all barns and roosters yeah, out yeah, there. Yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> Actually, there's a rooster in San Francisco at a, at a, 
a house sitting house I used to stay at that a uh, neighbor had a rooster. And I, that was a very rude awakening, pun intended. I, I grew up in the country. We raised chickens. We had roosters every morning. Yes, they loud. And not even only in the morning. All during the day. All the time. So wow, roosters. The, the, the bizarre sciencey question out of all this that honestly I'm surprised has not yet been answered is how does a rooster not go deaf from their own crowing? <laughs> I well maybe they are. How good a rooster? <laughs> so here is yeah. the answer finally coming from Belgium from University of Antwerp and the University of Ghent, both in Belgium. They found first <laughs> they they actually recorded with a tiny microphone near the ears of roosters. They recorded how loud the crowing would sound to a rooster based on where their ears are. They found it was actually louder than they projected, about 100 decibels, which is about the same as running a chainsaw with unprotected ears. And people who use chainsaws without protecting their ears would go deaf, and people do. And that's because of damage to their tiny hair cells in the inner ear. We talked about these last week or the week before. We've talked a lot about these inner ear hair cells and how we just wish we could get those back because a couple of those concerts in our teens and 20s that just weren't worth it well <laughs> um that this hundred decibel sound coming straight from the roosters they they are not going deaf they are not losing inner ear hair cells they actually these Belgian scientists performed microcomputerized tomography scans on the skulls of the bird to figure out exactly what was at stake mechanics-wise. They just wanted to see kind of what was happening physically on that bird's head. And they found that half of the bird's eardrum was covered by soft tissue that was essentially a dampener. It dampened the incoming noise all the time, so half of their ear. The other half, they found when the rooster tilted their head back to crow, this other material kind of flapped back and covered the second half of their ear so that their ears got completely covered like some earplugs. And so they, they equate this to sticking your fingers in your ears while making big noises or trying to avoid noises. So kind of like setting off the fireworks and then sticking your fingers in your ears. It actually does help. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so uh, these guys have their very own earplugs. What's more, birds can regrow damaged hair cells. So even if they had damaged them, they could recover them. In this case, it sounds like it's really not hurting them. The, the last bit they wanted to see about this study was what, how the hens and the chicks are being affected by the crowing. Because if dad's outside yelling all morning, that might affect those growing ears in the little chicks or the females may not have these mechanics, who knows. But they, they also found in this case that roosters are very particular about their vantage point and they want to find a vantage point with maximum reach and they pretty much always are pointing their crowing away from hens and chicks when they crow so that the they want the mo as many people to know that those are their hens and their chicks and this is their territory, but it also reduces the amount of um, decibels hitting the hen house. That's just really nice of them, yeah. roosters, to turn the other way and yeah, crow right. outwardly to the world as opposed yeah. to turning around into the farmyard <laughs> and yelling at the ladies. <laughs> hey, Janet! Get up! <laughs> Get the kids up! It's Get time to up. go! <laughs> oh, roosters, you did a good work. This is, I, I wonder how, I mean, this is such another interesting avian adaptation. I mean, these built-in ear protectors, the hearing protectors, but they don't even really, I mean, it takes a lot. You and I were, were talking very briefly before the show about the fact that birds can regenerate their hair cells. Yeah. So even if they damaged their hearing, the hair cells would regenerate, but you, you'd still be at a loss 
Mm -hmm. for those hair cells in the time that they were dying, had been dead, and then regenerated again. Just constantly be regrowing your your cells. It's like your your hearing aid being constantly on low power. Yeah. So I didn't know that about birds. I didn't know they could regrow their ear hairs. Yeah, the hair cells, they can regrow them. And so they don't have a problem with hearing loss like Mm -hmm. humans do due Mm -hmm. to sound damage. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, it's going to be a costly process to regrow them. And if you're crowing every day, you don't really have, you want to be able to hear other roosters and behaviorally, you don't want to have hearing downtime. So um, the ear protection adaptation is really interesting. It just makes me think of woodpeckers who have yeah. <laughs> similar adaptations to protect their brain. Right, because they would just constantly ha- be in concussion mode all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it, I find it, I, I think it's very fascinating, these very creative adaptations. Yeah, to, so. How could there be these bird behaviors? It's really cool. Yep. And again, an animal that has been with us for a very, very long time, and we are still learning what secrets it has for us. Oh, Thanks, so chickens. So many secrets. Yeah. <sighs> Little chickens. Little chickadees. We love you so much. All right, everyone. This is This Week in Science. We have reached the halfway point of our show. We'll be back in just a few moments with more stories. I've got more genetics. This is like my genetics week that's happening this week. Justin's got some cool news as well. We'll be back. Stay tuned. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We are glad you are here and we hope to be here week after week after week for, you know, years to come, but we need your help to be able to do that. So everyone, I'm going to direct you to our website. Twist.org is where you can find all the things you would love to find out about Twist. Uh, there's a huge subscribe button on our website now, twist.org. If you click on that subscribe button, it gives you options for the Google Play podcast directory for iTunes and for YouTube. So if you have not subscribed to those things, if you're an Android user, click on that Google Play button. If you use Apple and iTunes, click on the iTunes button to subscribe to our podcast. You want to watch us in video every week? click on that YouTube subscribe button. I want to see the numbers going up. I would love to have you subscribing and never miss a show. If you're subscribed, it's like a magazine subscription. It comes to you every week. You are let know. You you are let know. (laughs) The internets let you know about our new episodes as they come up. So uh, that subscribe button is very important to us. uh, And we hope that you will subscribe and become a part of our growth, our growing Twist Minion community. Also, no longer pre-order your 2018 calendars. We are pretty much out. I think I've only got like a couple of calendars left. So really, I'm pretty much out. Calendars. Thank you for buying the calendars. Yet again, Blair put an amazing, uh, amazing bunch of work together into drawing all of the art for the calendar and putting everything together for us. And I hope all of you who have gotten the calendar, enjoy it. Um, Also, if you want to help support Twists and to help keep us going, because if you've noticed, other than me talking right now, we don't have ads. We don't have sponsors. This is us, and it's you. You are the people who keep Twists going. And so in order to do that, there are a couple of things you can do. You can buy our merchandise, or you can 
you can sponsor us. <laughs> Basically, you can you can donate to keep us going. Uh, to buy our merchandise, click on the Zazzle store link in the twists.org website and find all of the awesome items that are in our store. We've got lumbar pillows. We've got twist polo shirts. There are art-based shirts from previous Blair's Animal Corner calendars. There's even wrapping paper, tote bags, and stamps. There are hats and mugs, all sorts of things with a twist logo. A portion of all of the proceeds comes back to help twist. If you're not into things, if you've already got yourself a twist hat, well, please consider supporting us financially through either Patreon or PayPal. If you want to try PayPal, you can click on the yellow donate button that's on the sidebar of the main page, or you can click on any episode page, scroll through the show notes, and down at the bottom, there are pink buttons that'll give you the option of being a one-time contributor, $10 a month recurring contributor, $5 a month recurring contributor, or $2 $2 a month recurring contributor. And if this is your preferred option, please go and do that now. However, if you're interested in supporting us through the Patreon community, you can click on the Patreon link on our, on our main header bar, and then click on that become a patron button that shows up when you get to our page. Become a patron and choose your level of support, whether it's $2 a month or $100 a month. Your support helps keep this show going, helps us pay all the bills, and basically be able to do this show. So we need your support, and we thank you for your support. And those of you who are unable to financially support us, to be able to click either of those links, if you're just like, oh, I just can't do it, tell your friends about Twists. Get them to subscribe, because if you can help us grow our community, that'll help, uh, help everything overall. It really does. So for all of you out there, thank you for all of your support. Thank you for listening in the first place. Thank you for being here. We really couldn't do this without you. I can't believe you believe in that shell. We disagree, but I still give a damn. The ramification of treatments from holy... And we're back with more this week in science yes we are we are back hey justin is do we have another thing right now oh we do we do we've got oh. a segment of the show that we need to do this weekend you what has science about. i always do now because i put it in the second half of the show instead of right off the top this is my problem <sighs> this weekend what has science done for me lately all right. Jerry Salem, PhD, writes in to say, science gave me a frame of reference in which to view the world. I was trained as a biochemist and eventually became a database designer. Wow. For me, I am able to view an entire system and break it down into individual components. When something goes wrong, I use the scientific method to analyze what is working and not working. I use enzymology to view data flow like enzyme reactions in a biochemical pathway, finding optimal paths and identifying bottlenecks. The tools I learned as a scientist help me identify problems and figure them out. This helps me every day. You don't have to be a scientist to think like a scientist. Jerry Salem, love the show. I mention it at least once a week to my friends and family. Awesome, thank you so thank much, you, Jerry. Jerry. Thank you for mentioning the show to your friends and family. We do appreciate that. But more so, thank you for writing in and thank you for sharing this because I think you're right. So many people, there's this idea of the ivory tower of science and that scientific thinking is this thing that's the domain of scientists. <laughs> well, you know what? Everybody Wait, can be what's a the scientist sound again? <laughs> <laughs> scientists and ghosts? They have That's a lot in common, right. turns out. <laughs> turns out, in my world. <sighs> yes. Well, it turns out that everybody has the capacity to think like a scientist, to be able yeah. to observe the world, to follow the scientific method where after you make an observation, you make some educated guesses called hypotheses about how things work. And then, you know, you can even test different options. You know, oh, it's... 
is it going to be better for me to melt the butter or not melt the butter before I put it into the chocolate chip cookie dough recipe? You know, you can test all of these things. You test whether or not you like a certain color lipstick or whether or not you like driving your, you know, if you drive your car fast on the freeway in a certain stretch of freeway, if you're going to get a ticket on a regular basis. <laughs> We test things constantly to be able to inform our world, right? And so you can make informed guesses, you can test those guesses, and then you can use the data, as long as it's not little anecdotes, but multiple points of data, you can use them to come to conclusions. And so the scientific method is something that's available to everyone to use. We can all be scientists every day. Alternatively, alternatively, we can just assume that everything is faded. Whatever will happen, what will happen. Whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Hey, Sarah, Sarah. Yes. To everything, Luck. turn, turn, turn. Luck, if you've ever been a lady to begin with. Luck. Wait, wait, wait. But before you jump into that, I need to remind everybody that I need your letters. So write in, let me know what science has done for you lately. Leave me a message on Facebook, facebook.com slash this week in science, or you can email me at Kirsten at this week in .com. Come on, tell me how, what science has done for you lately. I want to know. We've almost gotten through a year. We just have to go until like Earth Day, I think. And we'll have done a year of these. Come on, you guys. You're out there. You're thinking these thoughts. Write them down and send them to me. Okay. All right. Luck be a lady tonight. Hmm. Yes. Uh, people have been rolling the dice for over a thousand years, letting the fates decide the gambler's result. In Roman times, dice were visibly lopsided. <laughs> and it really didn't matter to the average Roman. After all, the dice were just a device to let the divining decisions of the gods come into play. Early medieval times, dice were often unbalanced as well. And the arrangement of numbers where one appears opposite two, three, opposite four, five, opposite six, it just didn't really matter. Some were symmetrical in form, others not so much. But again, who cares? It's just dice. They're just there for the fates to be employed. All that began to change around 1450 when dice makers and players seemingly figured out that the form of the dice affected their function, explains Yelmer Erkins, University of California at Davis, professor of anthropology Ooh. and Go lead Davis. author of the study on dice. Amazing he had time to do this research with all the roosters crowing. <laughs> I mean, I'm surprised they had electricity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's evidence that people who believed in uh, fate didn't uh, stop leaving it to chance alone, at least. Uh, a new worldview was emerging. The Renaissance. People like Galileo and Pascal were developing ideas about chance and probability. And we know from written records... In some cases, they were actually consulting with gamblers, says Erkins. Uh, we think users of dice also adopted new ideas about fairness and chance or probability in games. Standardizing the attributes of die, like symmetry and arrangement of numbers, may have uh, been one method to decrease the likelihood that an unscrupulous player had manipulated the dice to change the odds of a particular role. Dice are not common finds in archaeological sites, typically found in garbage, domestic areas, cemeteries, frequently are recovered as the lone objects in a site. So maybe there was, you know, nice places, nice flat spots to go roll dice. And so you would find a few errant lost dice there. And many of the finds that we have aren't very accurately dated. So after looking at hundreds of dice in dozens of museums and archaeological deposits across the Netherlands, Erkins and his co-author, Alex D. Vucht, the American Museum of Natural History in New York, were able to assemble and analyze a set of 110 carefully dated cube-shaped dice. The findings are published in the journal Acta Archaeologica in December. Uh, the result, the researchers found die made before 400, Romany times, are highly variable in shape, size, material, and configuration of numbers. Dice are very rare, 
between 400 and 1100 during the Dark Ages. Dice reappear around 1100, where they're predominantly in the Primes configuration, where opposite, nallies, opposite numbers tally to prime numbers, so 1 and 2, 3 and 4, 5 and 6. Uh, number styling was also popular in ancient Mesopotamian Egypt. And then around 1450, the system changes to sevens, where the opposite sides of the dice all add up to seven. Uh, dice also became highly standardized in shape and were made larger. Standardization, they think, might be in part a byproduct of some mass production of dice that was starting to take place. Hmm. Uh, yeah, but what's sort of interesting, it, they, he sort of ties this to a changing ideas of fate. Yeah, absolutely. Years. Well, it's like you don't understand if you don't understand that the asymmetry can actually be affecting the role. It's like, oh, it's the gods. But then you start becoming more methodical and uh, people start looking at, qu at things and asking these questions. And all of a sudden they go, oh, wait, why is it always coming up three? <laughs> It's not okay. Gods which just must like which, the number three. Which just happened to me this weekend. We have a we got some new games in the house, and I'm sitting down with my husband and son to play Catan Junior. Mm -hmm. Roll the dice. The dice. The dice is very important for your game in this in this game. Threes come up a very disproportionate number of times. <laughs> And so we're looking at, we're trying to look at this dice and I think there's an air bubble in there. I think they're, this thing is loaded wrong. This is, there's something <laughs> wrong with this dice. Even. No, we were not, we're not, we're not thinking that the fates were changing our fate in this game. No, somebody made this dice, this die wrong and I needed, it's defective. I need, it's defective. This die is defective and I need to go get a new one. <laughs> How about this one? Too many numbers. That's a, that's a big. That's a big die. How about this one? That has. That's an animal die. You yeah. have a. You have a die with animals all over it. I sure do. How about this one? That's a very large regular die. Why do you have so many dice? How about this one? It's a die in a die. Oh wow! <laughs> Did you guys not know I collect dice? <laughs> I, this uh, is the, this, nope, did not know this one. <laughs> Blair secretly is a dungeon master for advanced oh, Dungeons and look, Dragons. I do have Dungeons Consortium. and Dragons dice. <laughs> of course you do. Face up the San Francisco Zoo. <laughs> oh, I'm loving hey, this. Of course. It has French on it. Un, deux, trois. Oh my gosh, you still have more dice. How many dice do you have? <laughs> I have like 50 here. And this like is even my entire collection. There's a point when you've collected too many of anything. This one has a Give rabbit and a, oh, squirrel. And a raccoon oh, and a skunk. A, that looks like a story dice. Oh, that is a dice know. dice. That I don't know. Numbers. There's a beaver. The beaver's number one. <laughs> That's what they say in Canada. Yeah, for sure. For sure, eh? For sure, eh? Opossum. Oh, possum is number six. Yep. Sorry. Anyway, continue with the size. <laughs> there we go. Getting on another. There we go. Getting on another train. <laughs> Tangent train boarding once again at Dice Station. All aboard! All aboard! Oh my goodness. Well, now we <gasps> know what to get Claire for her birthday slash Christmas, Annika. I have enough. Please no. <laughs> It's that or what? Hippos. Hippos. More hippos. Always more, more hippos. Always more hippos. I mean, I have six within reach right here, but <laughs> definitely more. <laughs> All right. Blair's a collector. She's a collector, people. Moving on forward. <laughs> Blair might remember exactly where all of her collections are, but you know what? We talk sometimes about things like muscle memory how can a muscle have a memory well when you talk about muscle memory it's like oh you have these nerve pathways that get trained in from repetitive use and they fire faster you know because nerve cells that fire together wire together Ooh. hey hey that's right. right so um 
but but is there actually memory in the muscle itself? Is there? Well, researchers at Keel University have published in scientific reports, Nature, that muscles may not have memory of, you know, of how to move specifically, but they do have a sort of genetic memory that is retained after they are trained. So muscles that are trained and built have genetic changes, epigenetic changes. And these researchers from Keele University, along with universities of Liverpool, John Moores, Northumbria, and Manchester Metropolitan, looked at 850,000 epigenetic sites on human DNA and found the genes marked or unmarked with these epigenetic tags when muscle grows following the exercise, uh, following exercise and then returns back to normal and then grows again following exercise later, later in life. So they followed this process of muscle growth, shrinking, and then growth again, and looked at all of these epigenetic tags during the process. They found that the genes in muscle become more untagged with the epigenetic information when it grows following exercise in earlier life. And importantly, once they've been untagged, the genes stay untagged, even when muscle atrophies or is lost. But the untagging helps switch the gene on at a greater extent later in life. And so it's associated with a greater muscle response to exercise when you start training again. And so this muscle memory is there as an epigenetic fact of muscle life. Hmm. Yeah. So basically, uh, the the take home for this that how is this going to be applied and used is to figure out how it can be used in a couple of different ways. If if athletes are using muscle enhancing drugs, understand that once their muscles have been enhanced, their muscles are always going to have a, an enhanced response of sorts because of these epigenetic tags or untagging in this particular case. And so if you've ever used performance enhancing drugs, would that necessarily keep you from ever being able to compete again, even if it was a short acting drug mm. because the effect is long acting? So these are now questions that might need to be raised. Additionally, this could be applied to uh, the concept of muscle damage in athletics. And so what can you do when, uh, when muscles are in, when, when athletes sustain injuries in their muscles atrophy, and then in the rebuilding state, how can they rebuild them in the most efficient way possible? And maybe understanding how the epigenetic factors work could be applied to this. Yeah. I don't know, but I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea of these semi-permanent changes because of the the tags that go into the genes once you started once you started working out it never quite goes away it's like riding a bicycle right you well i think about muscle. when i think about muscle memory the the thing that comes to mind for me is playing a musical instrument mm. that's the thing for me that even if it's been two years since i've picked up my saxophone I can do a scale <laughs> and it, my brain isn't really doing any of the work. It's just my thingies. <laughs> right. But that's like, that's the nervous pathways that have yeah. all been, that mm -hmm. have all been activated. Who knows? Maybe there are epigenetic tags for all of those finger muscles. That's honestly what I'm wondering. <laughs> I d I'm serious. I think that if, if, um, if muscle memory has this effect on a larger scale, there's all sorts of small scale things that might be there. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Interesting questions. Hey, Justin, do you have another story? Oh, yeah. There's a vaccine now that cures cancer. Wait, what? Yeah. Uh, if you are a mouse. Yeah. For now. For now. For now. <laughs> Always. But well, Always they kind of tried the there. And um, here's the thing, though. It worked remarkably well. All right. 
So what they did was they injected minute amounts of two immune stimulating agents directly into solid tumors in mice. And it eliminated all traces of the cancer in the animals, including distant, untreated uh, metastases elsewhere in the organism of the mouse. This is a study led by researchers at Stanford University School of Medicine. They're saying it works for multiple types of cancers, uh, including those that could just arise spontaneously. So what they, what's pretty amazing about this is, is that cancer is one, it's one of the reasons it's really difficult to fight is that it figures out how to combat the T cells, which is who's tasked with going out and finding them and attacking them. What they've done here is by, by injecting this into a cancer cell first, into a tumor site first, is they've actually primed the T cells that made it inside to fight that cancer already and basically armored them up to go and fight more battles elsewhere after defeating. So it works with a... Re uh, to reactivate cancer-specific T cells by injecting microgram mounts of these two agents directly into the tumor site. One is a short stretch of DNA called CPG oligonucleotide, works with other nearby immune cells to amplify the expression of an activating receptor called OX40 on the surface of the T cells. The other, an antibody that binds to OX40, activates the T cells to lead the charge against the cancer cells. Because the two agents are uh, injected directly into the tumor cell, only T cells that have infiltrated are activated and therefore pre-screened as T cells that will recognize and attack specific cancer proteins. Then some of those T cells leave that specific tumor and they can find and identify and target that cancer anywhere else in the body. Wow. Yeah, so if it's metastasized, it's mm -hmm. going to attack it no matter mm -hmm. where it is. And it's not one-offs. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, a whole body treatment. It's not taking your T-cells out, genetic re-engineering re them, putting them back in, which is costly, time-consuming. Uh, yeah, they say the approach worked startlingly well in laboratory mice with transplanted mouse lymphoma tumors in two sites in their bodies, injecting one tumor site with the agents caused the regression, not just of the treated tumor, but also the second untreated tumor. Uh, in this way, 87 to 90% of the mice were cured of the cancer. Although it did return in three of the mice. So not perfect, but far and above results that you would expect. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's still, it's mice. It's, but it's a very dramatic effect. Yeah. Mice genetically engineered to spontaneously develop breast cancer in all 10 of their mammary pads also responded to treatment. Treating the first tumor that arose often prevented the occurrence of future tumors. Wow. That's a vaccine. All right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. There's uh, the current clinical trial is expected to recruit about 15 patients with low grade lymphoma. If successful, the levy lead researcher believes the treatment could be useful for many tumor types. He envisions a future in which clinicians inject the two agents into solid tumors on humans prior to surgical removal of the cancer as a way to prevent reoccurrence due to, so due to the unidentified metastases, right? So these are, these are cancer cells that are no longer hanging out at the tumor site. They might uh, be in some other location undetected. They might be in the blood. They might be in the brain. They could be anywhere else in the body. So by first injecting this and targeting, you can remove the big tumor, fine, but let those T cells go look for the stragglers. That's yeah. pretty amazing. He says, I don't think there's a limit to the type of tumor we could potentially treat as long as it has been initially infiltrated by the immune system. And, and so, and that's the story of cancer too, is that it's not just that your body can't fight it. It just can't fight it well enough. Uh, it does make the attempt. So if you've got T cells that are out there and they are looking to fight your cancer, this is uh, this is a little bit of juice. This is a little bit of uh, T cell steroid. It sounds like. Yeah, there you go. 
Get him pumped. Get him out there. Get him motivated. Come on. Yes. Hey, quit sitting around. Let's go get him. Let's go get some cancer. Yeah, come on. Go get him. So the, the hope is now that the clinical trial that they're recruiting, that they're that they're that it's successful you know that usually with the first of the clinical trials it's just to see that people can take the therapy well that 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 there's no negative results that are significantly more negative than whatever they are already affected by so um you know if they're already working to get to the the phase one phase two clinical trials phase it's all money and getting it happen. But I mean, this could be a fast track kind of thing if and, it, and it works. And it's likely to be, um, I think just the, so this is not his first rodeo, apparently. Yeah. Uh, so this is Ronald Levy, professor of oncology at Stanford University. He's, uh, he's also, he's, he was involved in the development of uh, another uh, and uh, a monk, monk clinical, I don't know how to say it, uh, antibodies that were approved as one of the earlier cancer, anti-cancer treatments in humans. So he's he's been part of a development of an anti-cancer treatment that worked in the past. So if we're if we're if we're betting, right, not rolling the dice, but if we if we're picking a <laughs> pony who says they found something big and new and it's gonna work. And he's got a, he's got priors, he's got a track record. That's uh that's a, you know. He's a repeat a cancer killer. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I hope he is. Keep it it's going. the kind of ser serial killer we enjoy in our society. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> we'll celebrate him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then we'll all really have to be three feet tall. It'll just, you'll have to get on the bandwagon, Blair. We'll I mean, you down. could be three feet tall. I'll be the tallest person in the world. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Speaking of traits that make you who you are, I got more genetics, more genetics, oh. more genetics. Um, so a, uh, a study was published this last week in Nature Biotechnology by researchers using a little tiny kind of cell phone sized and shaped device that is called a mini ion nanopore DNA reader. The mini ion is created by Oxford Nanopore Technologies and uh, it is used to sequence large strings of genetic data. However, it is highly error prone. Lots of errors to it. So people have been like, Meh, I don't know about the usefulness of it really in looking at whole genome sequencing of uh, the human genome, for instance. Well, these researchers said, we've got this mini ion nanopore. It only costs $1,000. And it's available with the, and, and the company is making it available with the entire community behind it as well, with all of the documentation that people have been developing for their various uses of this, of this device. I, I, and I believe this device is, uh, one of them was taken up onto the International Space Station to do genetic sequencing on the space station as well. So it's, it, this is a well-used device. Its limitation though, really is the fact that lots of errors. You can sequence a big, long string of DNA, but lots of holes in it. And so these researchers put together a protocol to generate ultra-long reads and to, to map them over and compare each other to be able to sequence the entire human genome. 2,867 million bases in size it covered 85.8 .8 of the reference genome. And then they increased the accuracy by incorporating complementary reads of shorter sequences of DNA. And we we're able to get their coverage up to 99.8% of the, of the genome. And so, yeah, it's pretty close. It's, uh, pretty it's, close, but 
as long as it's not, it's not actually making my jeans. It'll be. <laughs> it's not accurate. It's not actually <laughs> making your jeans, but 99.8% is good enough to be able to get into the sequences to piece it together as, as it, as it, as it really is for the most part. It's that's pretty much there. And for a little tiny device that's portable, you can attach it. You know, if you have a computer that can run the data, um, if you can get the data up to the cloud to run the run the data analysis in the cloud, you know, this is a device that could make genetic genetic sequencing for disease and for diagnosis um, available to anyone anywhere, even the International Space Station <laughs> or Mars. You know, this is tiny. It's a little device. It, this is it's amazing, and the price is um, is is not. Out, it's not a crazy price. I mean, people buy compute buy computers for a lot more mm -hmm. than a thousand dollars these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, human genome, the entire genome sequenced on a little tiny handheld device, um, mm -hmm. and more along those lines of genetics. What's what's in us came from our parents, right? All of our parents, and in yes. the conversation related to nature versus nurture. We got 50% of our DNA from our mom, 50% of our DNA from our father. There is 50% of each of them that's not represented in you. Mm -hmm. How much of that unrepresented DNA actually has an effect on you? Mm, because it affects how they act around you and yes. it affects your environment. Yes. And so this is the genetic, what they're calling, uh, what, what they are calling the genetic environment that mm. is influencing you. And they published this week in the journal Science, a, uh, a data set from 20,000 Icelanders, part of the Decode Icelandic company project looking at the uh, Icelandic population's genetics. They were able to get genetic and data uh, information about educational uh, attainment, so how far people went in school and uh, able to have DNA from the children and both parents. So DNA for all three individuals in a reproductive relationship, which is not necessarily possible in all other parts of the world. So having the environmental information, the behavioral information, and the genetic information is an essential part of what they were able to do here in Iceland. And what they found there is that the variants that do not get passed down, so the, the genes that are in your parents but not in you, had an effect that's about 30% as big as the genes that were passed down when it comes to how far you move ahead in life in school. That's a lot. It had a very large effect. But I mean, yeah. part of this, I mean, this is like you said, this is environment, right? Mm -hmm. And we know in my environment has a huge effect al already. So it's not just nurture, this genetic nurture. So I guess it's the proportion of nurture that's genetically mm -hmm. related. Mm -hmm. But it's like a quagmire, though, because it's a chain from their parents and their parents' parents of this genetic nurture. Mm -hmm. Well, and if you have siblings, then they're reflecting different genes than you have from your parents, and they are also part of your environment. So yeah. It's, again, nature versus nurture, it's always both. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, of course, we can't just leave it at that. We need to know exact details. Exactly about how much. Proportions for everything. Right. But of course, there's probably, there's all these variables that we're not controlling. The fact that it's Iceland. The fact that parents yeah. are not split. The fact that both of your parents that you're living around are actually your genetic parents. There's all these things going on that could have huge impacts on that data. Yeah. Uh, one of the interesting uh, points that's brought up is that uh, how in places like the United States where we don't have this kind of data uh, for 
entire relationships like this, we use adoption studies to be able to separate the effects of nature and nurture because you can get the information of a person and um, of, of identical twins who are separated at birth and they go off to live in different environments and get an idea of this nature nurture influence. Um, but he, the, one of the researchers says in this study, they're basically dividing the parents into two parents. And one of them is genetically an adoptive parent because these are genes that your mom has that you don't share. So it's a new method around disentangling why parents and children are similar. Hmm. So it's like you have your mom, which is mm -hmm. the genetic mom, and then you have your adoptive parent mom, which is the genes that you don't share. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it splits it all up. It's an interesting relationship there. Yeah. Blair, do you have another story? I do. Uh, it's pretty short. Uh, plastics are bad. That's it. Moving on. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and next we have... In what uh, way? In what way this well, time, I guess I should say. This week we found from James Cook University, they actually had an international team studying coral. They examined over 120,000 corals. They measured if they were pl in plastic-free environments or if they were in plastic-present environments. These were on 159 reefs in Indonesia, Australia, Myanmar, and Thailand. And they found that the chance of disease in the coral increased from 4% to 89% when the corals were in contact with plastic. That's not corals were ingested, didn't ingested the plastic and plastic was embedded in their system. No, just being around plastic went from 4% disease 89%. That's that's huge. Yeah. Just a massive, massive increase. Plastics are bad. So as I wrote in the show notes, don't take that disposable straw, Karen. Mm -mm. No more. No more people. Straws. No more. And no more single use plastic or at least reduce. Reduce your single use plastic. If Bring you your can. grocery and bag. There, and there are ways we, you know, tote bags. There's a twist mm -hmm. tote bag over there on Zazzle. <laughs> mugs. We have lots of mugs. Yeah. Have, have and, your travel uh, mugs. Um, and promote promote companies that use biodegradable plastics made from corn and potatoes. And there are companies. There's one. I think it's called uh, Trex, maybe. I don't know if I'm, if I'm remembering that correctly. But there are recycling companies that mm -hmm. collect plastics like the, mm -hmm. the plastics that are not re usually recyclable through recycling programs mm -hmm. like uh, plastics um, bread bags or plastic mm -hmm. bags from the produce section of the grocery store plastic wrap mm -hmm. all these plastics that just kind of end up in your life that you don't really know what to do with the plastic of from your your from your cheese stick yeah you know there's one these... called TerraCycle, and Terra actually if you but, if I was, you, but what I was going to say yeah. is that the, these companies, they work through large chain grocery stores mm -hmm. to collect these otherwise non-recyclable plastics, and they sell them to companies that recycle them and use them to create various products yes. out of plastic. And Absolutely. so you can, when you go to the grocery store, take your plastic bags that you've been collecting and take them right to the recycling and they'll it, make you feel better. <laughs> and check your local recycling policies. Uh, in some neighborhoods, they've started to accept soft plastics and plastic bags like grocery bags in the blue bin. So those are things to check for. But ultimately, all of that stuff, we'd be better off if we just weren't making it because yeah. so much of it still ends up in the ocean. So really reducing the production of plastic is going to have the greatest impact. But just here's yet another reason, plastics in the ocean, we know it's a problem. It's increasing disease in corals. And corals are keystones for uh, aquatic ecosystems in, in the ocean. They're already under uh, a lot of stress from climate change and ocean acidification. 
And this is another stressor. So, um, you know, we don't want to see these stressors piled on top of each other. And we won't because, yeah. because corals make 50% of our oxygen that we breathe. <laughs> so if the corals won't survive, we probably won't either. So we need corals. Let's keep them alive. Let's do what we can. I think that's a, yeah, yeah I think that's a pretty good note to finish on here. Yeah. This week in science. Yeah. We've done another episode. <gasps> Yay! We made it to the end of the show. You guys oh, got you anything skipped, else? You skipped my favorite story that you thought okay. you were going to bring. Okay. Please okay. don't. So I'll, I'll throw it in here. I was going to... Would... And only because I thought this was absolute junk. Because I've <sighs> heard this as a as a crypto file of sorts. Okay, I've no one knows what you're talking about. This... Kiki needs to introduce the story. <laughs> the Voynich Manuscript. We've talked about it on the show uh, occasionally for years and years. It's 240 pages long. It was discovered over 100 years ago. And it's this encoded document that people have been pouring over it, trying to translate it, to decode it. It's got these illustrations through it. People think it's something of a, uh, a, a medical textbook or some kind of, of, do of document. Some people think it has something to do with, uh, with the female, uh, female health and reproduction. Um, but because of Turns the out it's just undecipherable nonsense. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So the uh, the researchers, the newest paper on this is a group of Canadian researchers have taken a new tack on trying to decode the document. Artificial intelligence. They used an artificial intelligence algorithm to try and figure out if there were any commonalities and figure out if it was like there was a code in there somewhere. And the AI came back and said, hey, that's coded Hebrew. And that was news mm -hmm. to everybody because they thought it was Arabic or something. So now knowing that it's Hebrew, they decided to try and de decipher it and they were able to come up with a phrase that doesn't really make any sense. The first sentence is, she made recommendations to the priest, man of the house, and me and people. Uh-huh. Right. So, so what they, what, but the, the th part that got me is they say 80% of the words they could find in the Hebrew dictionary yeah. from what they pulled out. But they're thinking this is not just your run-of-the-mill average modern-day Hebrew. This is like an ancient Hebrew dialect. So it's going to be, you know, we're going to have to go not just pull out the dictionary. You're going to get have to get people who've researched ancient texts and see if there's similarities. This is fascinating to me, too, because this has been like one of those things that people have been working on cracking for the longest time. And then, oh, let's put it in the computer and see what happens spits out the uh oh yeah first of all this is hebrew not arabic no wonder you're having trouble <laughs> um <laughs> like and, it's, well, and it is coded it's an alphagram where they they uh they jumble up the the words in a, in a certain manner but it's 600 years old right so that's not that oh, ancient well, really uh uh, I don't. Is it six hundred years old? I don't know if it's. That, if that's I mean, well, that's what the headline says. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, that's when the book was found. No, it was Wasn't only it? found about a oh, no. over a hundred years ago. So they yeah. think the thing's only six hundred years. So that's not. So there's <sighs> there's written Hebrew that looks pretty much the same as modern day Hebrew. That's way older than six hundred years. Yeah. This is just a really, it's a book. This is a book with paper pages. It's, uh, but really old paper pages that are, you know, it's, it's a fragile old book. But who knows? But the, the big thing here, yeah, Hebrew? Who knew? And now they're going to be able to use this AI methodology on other difficult mm. to crack texts and see what we can, what we can get. What can we find in history? of the unreadable texts it's really pretty the 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 oh, there's so many loop-de-loops all the the mm -hmm. manuscript code yeah i think it kind of looks like elvish yes 
It definitely does. <laughs> I'm like, oh, look, it's the Lord of the Way the Rings. <laughs> Lord of the Rings. These Lots women are making wine, there. I think. <laughs> Isn't it? In Sounds the main probably. picture in this article, it looks like women are stomping on grapes. And then if you scroll down another picture, it looks like a series of tubes that they're they're pushing wine through. Because we all know what's important. Yeah. Well, according, you wine know, to all. According to the, never mind. <laughs> I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna let's just stop. Stop. and let's just call it right here. We're gonna mm -hmm. stop right here. We got the story in artificial intelligence, ancient Hebrew. It's all good. Bringing the past and the future together. <sighs> and uh, as we get out of the show, have you guys heard of the Mars Desert Research Station? No. No. Oh, well, it was. It was created by the Mars Society in 2001, quote, to better educate researchers, students, and the general public about how humans can survive on the red planet. And they have occasional, they have crews that rotate through and they do, uh, they, they, they pretend, they simulate living on Mars. And right now, Crew number 188 from the International Space University are in a two-week rotation to simulate living on the red planet. Oh. And in a few weeks, February 21st, we're going to be talking with the mission commander, university professor Ryan Kobrick. And so in the meantime, I invite everyone to take a look at the Mars Desert Research Station. And uh, they've got a Facebook page. They are Team ISU on Mars. And let us know if you have any questions for the crew, for the commander that we can that we can include in our interview. We would love to have questions for you for our conversation. And that brings us to the point in our show where I say thank you to people. Thank you to everyone who for watching, first and foremost, or listening. And thank you to Identity4 for helping to, <coughs> excuse me, record this show. Tickle, tickle, that came out of nowhere. And to Fata for helping with the show notes and to Brandon for helping to simulcast us onto Facebook and to our Patreon sponsors. I would like to say thank you very much to those of you who support us on Patreon. Thank you to Aaron Luthen, Alex Wilson, Andy Grow, Ben Rothig, Bert Lattimore, Bill Kersey, Bob Calder, Brendan Minish, Brian Condren, Brian Carrington, Byron Lee, Charlene Henry, Christopher Dreyer, Christopher Rappin, Craig Landon, Deepak Chopra, The Woo Master, E.O. Edward Dyer, Eric Knapp, Flying Out, Gary Swinsburg, Greg Briggs, Greg Guthman, Greg Riley, Jacqueline Boyster, J Jason Olds, Jason Roberts, Jim Drapeau, John Crocker, John McKee, John Ratnaswamy, Joshua Fury, Ken Hayes, Kevin Parachan, Kurt Larson, Lisa Slizewski, Matt Sutter, Marjorie Cohen, Mark Hessenflow, Matthew Litwin, Matrick Cohn, Paul Disney, Paul Sampson, Richard Hendricks, Richard Onimus, Robert Aston, Robert Coburn, Rudy Garcia, Sean Lamb, Steve Lessman, Stephen DeBell, Tony Steele. Thank you so much for your support of This Week in Science on Patreon. And if you would like to support us on Patreon, you can find information at twist.org or at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. And remember that you can also help us out just by telling your friends about Twist. And on next week's show, we will be back once again with more great science news on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time on twist.org slash live. You can watch there and join our chat room. Hey, chat room. But if you can't make it there, you can find past episodes at twist.org slash YouTube or just at twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have a mobile type device, you can look up Twist, the number four Droid app in the Android Marketplace or simply This Week in Science and anything Apple Marketplacey. 
For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org. When you go there, you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts or the other listeners. Yeah, or you can just contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistmeaning at gmail.com, or Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback if there's a topic you would like us to cover or address a suggestion for an interview and a haiku that comes due in the night please let us know we'll be back here next week and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news and if you've learned anything from the show remember it's all in your head This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just get understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. 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 And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the eye Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science 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 This week in science This week in science This week in science 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 I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got But how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you learn anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, science, science. This week in science, this week in science. This week in science, this week in science. This week in science, this week in science. And we have come to the end of the show once again it's time for us to be done well not done done it's the after show everyone it's time for the after show it's time for the after show oh please don't go oh please don't go it's time for the after show
or you know, I don't, if you have to go, go right ahead. Um, I mean, I guess. I guess if you gotta go, you gotta go, and then okay. Um, sorry for that coughing fit there. I don't know what happens in my throat. And coughing. these things happen. Oh, and I've got the yawning now. Start row. When the yawning's happening. I think I'm tired. Got my. I was tired before the show, and I up, up, upped my energy. I was like, "Here we go, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. show time, everyone!" And now I'm like, I could go, I could go relax, I could go read my book. Books are good. I read. I have read the entire uh, Expanse series. Oh dang! All seven books. And they have no novellas and whatnot. Really good. Nice. Let me recommend it for those of you who like the science fiction reading. Mm -hmm. uh, what did I recommend last week? Reincarnation Blues. Mm -hmm. For those of you, I read that recently. For those of you who are interested in books of a more, I don't know, humorous yet biblical perspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, same author wrote a book called Up Jump the Devil, also quite mm -hmm. good, mm -hmm. very entertaining. Um, what am I reading now? I'm reading a book now. The first book was called Authority, second book, Annihilation. It's a trilogy about a weird area. I think they're making a movie or a TV show out of it or something. I didn't realize that. But I'm reading that book. And, oh, I just started reading Being a Beast, which hmm. I think, Blair, you might be interested in. Yeah. If you haven't heard about this book, it, uh, a British naturalist wrote a book about literally trying to live like various animals. <laughs> <laughs> so trying to live like a badger. So, okay. Like eating earthworms. That is and ambitious. Stuff, right? And uh, <laughs> rubbing rubbing your butt on things to scent mark them. Yeah. So all of the I'm things. still trying to learn how to live like a hairless ape descendant. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's enough. So hard enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's fascinating. Right. The the con the concept. I understand. It's the. I, it comes from the idea that we tend as humans to anthropomorphize or to look at the lives of animals through our human lens. And so mm -hmm. in order to help, help imagine how these animals might live their lives, that he, he has various chapters on different, like I think one of them is a fox, a deer, an otter, a badger, a bird there's some kind of bird that he it's anyway all these animals he tries to live like them hmm. to be able to capture their mindset and imagine imagine really what what their lives must be so like. he's mm -hmm. badger promorphizing himself <laughs> <laughs> fox promorphizing wow. that's right that's pretty wild yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it, it's, it's, and his writing style is pretty fun too. So recommend it as a book. Um, Ed from Connecticut, yes. The Ed's Expanse books are awesome and great. Absolutely. Does anybody have any? I'm going to finish this trilogy pretty soon and be looking for other recommendations. I kind of, after The Expanse, I kind of burned myself out on science fiction for a while, I think. Hmm. So I, I'm looking, I, I think I liked Reincarnation Blues and Up Jump the Devil because they kind of had a um, Tom Robbins feel to them. Mm -hmm. Kind of that fun. Mm -hmm. I want more books that are like that. Absurdist like, kind of. Absurdist and fun. And just, mm -hmm. you know, these creative ideas and these great characters that you're like, what are they doing? I want more books like that. So if... Um, do you have any recommendations for me? I'm looking. I just mm -hmm. reread my favorite book, Slaughterhouse Five. Mm. That Vonnegut is always a good choice. 
I, I, I never, I never tire of him. Never. I, uh... Oh, Artemis, you like, uh, Ed from Connecticut likes the new book by Andy Weir. Artemis. Mm. Mr. Nice, Howard Marks, an autobiography. Ooh, he sounds cool. True story, absurdist yet true story. <laughs> that could be fun too. Ah, I love it. Um, yeah, I've read I've I read Tom's mo Tom Merritt's most recent book, but I haven't tried J. F. Dubo, A God in the Shed. I'll check that out. J. F. Dubo. There's so many. There's all sorts of good books. I, I, there's a sticker on um, a bus stop down the street for me that I walk past. And when I walk past it, it makes me smile every single time because it's just this kind of, it's like a punk rock sticker in its, in its text style. And it says, read books all the effing time. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, and I, I walk past and I go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that sounds great. Portland does have my favorite bookstore uh, I've ever wandered around in. Powell's. Yeah, that place is so awesome. Yes, Powell's Books is amazing. Good place to get lost in the books for sure. On a so, rainy day, which is like every day in Portland. Yeah, I know. I know, like... I mean, it used to be like nine months out of the year. Maybe now it's like seven months out of the year. No, <laughs> steadily decreasing rainy proportion of the year. But oh, something that was interesting. I saw on I follow William Gibson on Twitter, and the uh, the recent story about the uh, the 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 Dutch cyber security this baby basically the dutch cyber intelligence catching the russian spies doing stuff in dutch cafes they like basically found the evidence for the russian tampering in elections and stuff but then it was the dutch intelligence that mm. sent this information anyway they they set up a sting operation because the russians were using this like cafe's internet and the cyber intelligence found it. Anyway, like William Gibson posted, he's like, it's a really strange world to be living in that I'm seeing things happen in the real world that I would have put in one of my books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought that was interesting. Mm. When our writers telling the stories of the future. They're here. They're here now. Ron Chernow's U.S. Grant. Yeah, and lots of new science fiction are using really good science. It's true. That's what it is. They hacked Cozy Bear. That's what it was. Thanks, Bleak. They hacked into their IP cams in the lobby and watched them coming and going. Thank you. Yes. They watched the Russians coming and going. That's the detail of it. Thank you. <laughs> Eric and AK, yeah, that is the basic problem with cyberpunk stories. We're there now. It's not like a futuristic thing. It's actually, oh, that's actually happening now. So it's not fiction of the future, which was made it really fun once upon a time. Now it's like, oh, this is is really happening. Is there anything? No. Anything going on? No. That we need to discuss. We don't have any shows coming up other than our weekly show. We're in a quiet spot right now. Mm -hmm. Thank Jeez. goodness. It's good. Yeah. We're going to have a little, a little quiet. A little quiet for a little while. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Yeah. Like, like lists like that. Smithsonian's best science books of 2017. Thanks, Ed. 
Um, and I think, um, I don't know if Smithsonian put it on their list. Uh, let me check, but cannibalism, I think was one of the best science books. Was it? No, maybe not for Smithsonian. Oh, the evolution of beauty. We interviewed him. Mm. Richard Prum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there was a big chicken. Maybe we should get Marin McKenna on here to talk about antibiotics. Yeah. Chicken pharma. Great. I'd love to talk with Marin. Oh, here's another. Let me, I, I'm just going to go through this list of books and figure out how many of them we interviewed the authors for. <laughs> Magnitude, the scale of the universe. We interviewed we Megan Watts, Wattsy and Kimberly Arcand. So that's cool. Um, we did not interview numbers in the making of us counting in the course of human cultures. That looks fun. Code breakers, American women code breakers of World War II. Why time flies. Gravity's kiss, the detection of gravitational waves. Oh, do I have that book? I may have that book in a box. Paleo art, visions of the prehistoric past. The evolution of beauty. We interviewed Richard Prum. What it's like to be a dog and other adventures in animal neuroscience. What future, the year's best ideas to reclaim, reanimate, and reinvent our future. Mm. Mm. <laughs> this book's tone, according to Publishers Weekly, is worried but optimistic. <laughs> It is it avoids cliche and blind optimism in favor of unflinching realism. It's hmm. a good list. It's a good list. Does my audio always seem quieter? Hmm. I don't know why that is. I have it. I have my audio like all. I'll pumped up. I keep pumping it up. I, I think higher it's and just because me and Blair are unusually loud people. What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know. I think you're just a normal person, and me and Blair. Yeah, we're shouty. Wow, shouty people. Yeah. Oh, and I need to check. Like, right, Eric, about the February National Geographic bird intelligence, right? Lara's loud because she's a big city girl and she has to be heard over the din of all the what? cars and people and huh? sounds going on. Whereas I live surrounded by roosters, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> it must be loud it's, to be it's heard. It's hard for the technology to get to you, you know? So you have to, you have to really, you have Blair's to shout just, to get it. Blair's that's how we, that's how we text. Blair's just having to always talk over the sound of the rolling dice. Oh, yeah. Yes. We are, so I am on the National Geographic website. And why is it not telling me about bird brains? Hello. Hello. Mm. Why are they making it so hard to find... The most recent episode, the most recent issue, issue. Oh, it's so hard. No, I don't want to subscribe to your magazine right now. I'll find it. It's Why Birds Matter. Is that what it is? Why Birds Matter. I'll tell you why birds matter. That's January, though. <laughs> I like the birds. Eric says it's the February. February. All right. I know. I need to start shouting. I'm not much of a shouter. Not all the time. Maybe I need to talk right into oh, my microphone is. like this. Mm -hmm. If I get on my microphone all the time like this, then everything will be loud and happy. But see, Kiki, you're the most you're the most like qualified to be on the show, so you don't have to overcompensate with volume. <laughs> Wait a second. Wait a sec. Hold everything. I like that. Thanks, Blair. Hold everything. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. 
It's a it's a it's a direct graph of like number of degrees earned and decibels. It's kind of like an inverse. So that's but, so we're compensating with loudness yeah, for yeah. our lack of general yeah. knowledge. If you're loud, you're right. <laughs> Well, in that case, you're much louder. Brainiacs, than that. awesome. Sure. I talk about bird brainiacs all the time. I love the bird brainiacs. Um, volume, volume, volume. I don't need to be louder. I'm not going to be louder. I'm yeah, not the, going to be louder. The, the problem we've had, and it's we've had it for as long as we've been doing this without being in a studio together, mm. is that we don't have a central level check. No, nope. yeah, we have right. to go. Are you? Can you hear me? Do I sound yeah, loud I enough? And, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, and it's annoying, and it's and it varies. Like I've been quiet, Blair's been quiet, ish. Never. I mean, over time, it does seem like it it changes which one of us is not being heard as well, and so we make a little tweak to the soundboard or this and that, but we still can't tell from where we're sitting if things are at all in in line i have absolutely we rely no on you the no listening way. audience to give us this sort of feedback yep we're relying on the feedback of our chat rooms yeah. oh jamie hall on youtube is saying the first time you've ever watched a live stream but you've been listening for years hello jamie thanks for watching glad you're here thanks for saying hello Yeah, so Identity 4, you're right. Yes, we could each record our own microphone and then somebody combine all the tracks afterwards. Yes. And yes, the SGU does that. Or, or we could we just like listen to the show ourselves once in a while and see if the volumes are... I, 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 do, volu I do volume matching post-production stuff. So oh. I take it and I fix it later. Hmm. Yeah. I take it and I say, match loudness. I want it all to be minus 16 luffs. Hmm. Luffs? Luffs are... What is this, a Dr. Seuss Luffs look? are loudness units for sound. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh there you You're no, making I'm, that up. I'm not. I think, I think I'm not making it up. My memory is just failing me a little bit. Yeah, but it is LU is loud loudness units but it's, it's loudness how loud does it sound and for podcasting it's recommended that you have a minus 16 luffs level uh for radio you want it to be minus 24 luffs okay luffs stand convenient. for loudness units relative to full scale okay relative to full scale there we go there we go for sound i like for sound better sound. loudness units for sound <laughs> As opposed to for right. something else. <laughs> for color. That's it. Colors can be loud. That's really loud colored. There, there you go. Hello. Yes, Identity 4. I have the magic make it better button. I wish I did. <laughs> I wish I did. Yeah, so recording each of our streams, it does take more equipment. It, you have to have, I mean, it's not terrible. We could each have Audacity. I don't know if we could do it, though, using Hangouts uh, or if you have to have uh, something. Yeah, anyway, but each of us could record our own. and then, But then I'd have to rely on everybody sending me all the files and not forgetting to send me all the files and not going to work without sending me the files and all that kind of stuff. I much prefer to have it all on my own. Um, and I like having video, which is really great because there is another new option for uh, audio only, which is amazing, which um, it makes recording really easy. It's a new, and it's like through the browser. It's great, but um, I'm totally blanking on what it's called right now but it's a really great great uh great platform what is it called hold on let me find it i 
Zencaster. That's what it is. Mm, they advertised at the podcasting conference I went to. Yeah, Zencaster. Z e n c a s t r. If you don't have a need for video and just want to record an audio conversation, Zencaster is the bomb. I tell you right now, it's good stuff. Makes it very easy. You don't need a lot of extra equipment. It's great. Yes, Identity 4, that's exactly the hard part, getting the mic signal to the Google Hangouts and the recording software, because especially when you're on Mac, I mean, I know, I think PC is a little bit easier because you can line direct things a little bit more easily, but um, especially on Mac, it's like once one program takes priority for the audio, it's like nobody else can use it. Yeah. You got to work, you got to work around things. And sometimes it's janky. And when I tried to do workarounds in the past, it ended up, I ended up having a delay in my audio related to my video and there are all this trouble I'm giving up. Go simple, the simple route. <laughs> Identity for it, the gobbledygook language version of dynamic range. Yep, pretty much. But it's the standard now in the audio world. The luffs. How loud is it? Luffs. luffs. You're a luff. And I get it confused now because I have to think about the luffs in audio and I'm doing video production and doing color correction and I have to think about the LUTs. Wait, the, we have color correction? I don't do color correction for us, no. But when I produce videos oh. for my other job that I do, <laughs> one of my... I'm a video producer don't, and editor, don't you know? <laughs> I'm making the videos. Yeah, and um, LUTs. LUTs. LUTs are... Uh, now I'm forgetting what... Um, Boundless units for television. No. Transfer. Ah, now I'm forgetting what that is. LUTs and LUTs. I'm getting confused. Yeah. But... Okay. LUTs, if you have a LUT, it basically gives all of the color information for an image. So you can use a LUT and apply it to a video or an image to change the color makeup. Look up table. Thank you, Dave Shorty. <sighs> all these terminology things. I did not say sluts, Growly Bear. I said yes. LUTs. I said lots, slutty lots, <laughs> all over the place. All right, kids. Uh, it is Thank now. Thank you, Dave Shorty. Yes, there you go. Define, defining, mapping for color space. See, he had a short, elegant definition there. <sighs> hmm. I'll see y'all yeah. next week. Soundflower. Good night, minions. Good night. Plug your ears around roosters. Yeah, we we need earplugs around roosters. Roosters do not need earplugs around us. I wonder when that trait first developed. How long have birds been right. doing this? A great question. And why are they doing it? I mean, I get that sound is so important to a bird mm -hmm. that you know that might be something that's a high priority. But how long have they been doing it? Were dinosaurs to dinosaurs? Like, does it go back mm -hmm. that far? Did dinosaurs have dino song? Did they have, or were they so loud that they had to plug their ears to prevent those hairs from breaking? Or, or well, they why were they because... deaf? Yeah. Are, we got to learn <laughs> these things. Wow. Good night, Ed. Good night, Identity. Good night, Hot Rod. Good night, everyone Good night, in the chat room. I'm going to spend Robert. tomorrow playing with Luffs and Lutz. I Luffs, Luffs you all. Lutz. Gross. You. <laughs> all right, everyone. We will see you next week. Thanks for joining us yet again, Blair and Justin. Mm -hmm. Thanks for another great show. It was fun. It was a fun one. It was. And then Justin says, but they're all the. <sighs> <laughs> I don't even need to be part of it. I don't actually need to do my running commentary anymore. Blair, you've got you've got my side of everything covered over there. Yeah. 
Blair knows but what I you're going to say. Stop I, I will. I will point out this is not the first time at the end of the show that we've mentioned it was a fun show or a good show or a great show. I'll just I'll point that out. Like we. We seem to be pretty pleased with ourselves every week. <laughs> as as I think we should be every week. Ta -da! <laughs> That's right. You're welcome. Everyone take a bow. Everyone in the chat room, take a bow. Thank you. Hey, we'll see you next week. Say goodnight, Blair. Good night, Blair. Say goodnight, Justin. Good night, Justin. Good night, Kiki. Good night, Kiki. Good night.